Am yeah. I live? All right. So this is Andy Street here. I'm I'm with SBS, and thank you, Brandon, for that um, introduction. And I'm what I'm going to do is basically go through a demonstration of of some aspects of the integration of AUD with uh, GIS, and in this case, looking specifically at, at uh, small world GIS and some of the nuances associated with that. Um, I'm already open in, within AUD, and, and I don't have access to the SAP environment, so I've already linked this, this uh, drawing that I'm working to a work order in SAP. So I'm going to start off with basically with a, the context of when I get into AUD, the first thing I need to do is basically having linked the work order is, is navigate to where the job that I'm intending to do is. Um, and we, we have a number of ways of doing that. So the first thing I'm going to do is basically go ahead and search in the GIS for uh, objects. So we have this thing called a GIS navigator. This is a custom dialog that we can configure to allow us to search from within AUD for features that are within the GIS. So it could be gazetteers, address searches. I could look for map grids. If you have a series of map grids, I can specify uh, say so go ahead and look for map grids that are available with that number series. And it will search now against small world and come back and return the, the grids that it finds. Okay, I didn't press the button. So if I click on that now and I just say go to it and, and add a marker, it'll draw a boundary that allows me to say here's a, here's a background map. Um, in this case, uh, PSC used uh, a design management tool in small world um, called Design Manager that. that basically publishes a series of jobs and I can search for jobs. I can I can actually look up the work orders that may have been set within Small World and say, take me to the boundary for that. Uh, associated with that job, there's a lot of other additional information like versions and types of job and various other criteria. And we can make that available and understandable to the to the designer as well. In, in other implementations, we've actually uh, made it such that you could actually digitize a work order polygon within AUD and send that directly to uh, Small World or other GIS systems so that that would then be already included. In this case, though, I'm just going to kind of narrow that. I'm just going to search for an object, an individual object based on a whole number. I can use multiple criteria to search, but I've got, I've got one I've already picked out. So if I just say go search for that one, uh, go to it and then add a marker. Here is now the location of a pole in my void, which is the world at the moment in my map. I am using a coordinate system, Washington 83 North in feet. Um, but other than that, all I have is a, a point in space. So I can now add a background map that might give me a bit more detail and give me a bit more of a feel for where I am in the world. And here's a, an example that was downloaded, I think from a Google source. We can, we can basically go and get maps from multiple different sources. We can, we can get them from, um, you know, Google Bing, Near Maps, um, there's a Nokia system, there's a whole series of ones, or, or internal web management, uh, web mapping systems that you might have available um, that we can link into and actually download maps and, and leverage those. In, in addition, I could uh, basically use this NetMap service um, to search using the geocoding tools as part of that. So I'm going to show an example of that. I can type in an address, or in this case, I've already prime the pump, if you will, by knowing the address of a certain location. Um, what I actually did to do this is, is basically do a reverse geocode, click on a point, it tells me what's here, copy the result, and then I stuck it back into the, uh, the geocoder and said, go find me that location. All right, so if I say there, go to that, it will now give me a marker, here's my address in the world. Um, that, that I could go to. So basically there's two ways of searching, one using um, the GIS system and another using uh, a, a commercially available web mapping system. I'm just gonna remove that result. So now once I'm here, the, the other thing I can do is now use like things like Street View within Google or Bing services. Um, and I can say, well, I wanna start off and I wanna look in that direction there. It opens up a little web browser that links to the web mapping service. and I can lock it so it's on top all the time so it doesn't disappear behind. And then I can just start scrolling around and look and say, well, here's my poll that I just downloaded. So I can see a picture of it and I can see what information related to it. Okay, it's, it's got some kind of riser or something on it. Um, and it's got a wire going across the road and there's a, presumably another poll somewhere over here. 
that has a transformer and then conductors and stuff as well. So there's more data around and I can do a little check. I can compare what I'm going to see when I import from the GIS. So that's kind of helpful to you know have that kind of relatively up to date. It depends on the history. This is a 2018 map, but I can search from history with the Google Maps and say, show me how things have changed over time as well. So anyway, that's just kind of a kind of a background that you can go ahead and request that information. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go ahead and download some land data. So if I go into my electric design, go to start project, and I'm going to say import land base. In this implementation, we, we can support, um, we're, we're integrating with, with land, gas, and electric features. So a drawing could potentially contain all three of those types of data, which is stored in the small world database. Um, but you import them separately. And this, in the way this is set up at the moment, is we, we, we basically, you say, I want the land-based object. So I'm just going to draw a big box around this area here and say, go get me land. Okay, in this implementation now, what it does is it actually lists all the different types of features that I could potentially go and import. And, it, and these are the internal names of the objects in the small world database. So I can toggle certain ones off if I don't want them all, or I can just say, go ahead, do the import. And now it comes into something called model mapper or model map rather, which is a tool, it's an ETL tool, which is an extract transformation and loading tool that goes and reads data from small world and transmutes them and, and basically modifies the features with a series of transformational steps before writing it to the target system, which in this case for land base is AutoCAD entities. So the important thing here is that um, AutoCAD is, uh, or AUD rather, sorry, it has models built in to the SQLite database that within the electric and the gas partitions and also water as well. But land-based, there isn't a, an, an actual SQLite data model. So what we do instead is we just write AutoCAD entities. So if I select an entity over here and I have a look at the properties, I can see this is something on the land parcel extent layer. There's a line type scale of 50. There's a whole series of other attributes that have been set up for it. But there's also additional information that, that is kind of hidden underneath the cover. So I, I wanted to just mention because it is useful potentially in some cases. So if I do an extended data list on this object, it'll show me that this is an object with land parcel extent, feature key, this is the unique ID, but it also has a parcel number, which is another attribute that's read from small world that is available that you could use in reporting or in functions that you wish to write within the AUD environment to support grabbing pieces of information necessary for designs and whatever that you are working on. You don't have to have the information only in the, in the AUD model, you can get data from other sources as well. So now I'm going to actually go ahead and import some electric data go to my selection over here. And if I just draw a little box, in this case, um, it doesn't actually come up with a, an options list of here's the things that you can choose to download. The the configuration says the electric import list is predefined and you know, users draw a box basically and it gives them everything electrical. But we could set that up in different ways to say, you, know, you could say overhead, underground, uh, high voltage, low voltage, whatever you want. You could, you could basically make that kind of distinction. And now it's pulled in the data and it's actually created AUD features. So if I now go and click on my, uh, well, I guess there's a pole here, Click on that pole, I can see that this containment of the framings and the risers and the transformer that were pulled from small world. The number of attributes are specified, um, a lot of GIS related information. We do try and look up model names and model groups for features as they import, but in some cases there isn't a direct match. So in those cases, um, we may need to, or the designer may need to, to set some more information in the model before they started designing on top. But Having selected features, I've got containment, and I should have some connectivity here, segments um, that are joined to uh, poles and to conductors and whatever would be available. I can see the connectivity and, and uh, the relationships are being built for me. Um, so now what I'm going to do is just do a very, very simple 
and not I'm not even going to call it a design quite frankly because it's 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 so um, trivial it's not really being designed as such all I'm doing is just going to lay out some stuff and show you some of the features associated um, with the with the process of actually sending things or modifying things to be able to send them back so we do support um, inserting updating and removing features from the GIS using the model map process um, so in this case I'm going to um, digitize a new service line And what I'm going to do is just basically say that this customer's being fed by a meter on the other side of the of the property. Okay, so there's a new meter coming in. And now what I'm going to do is is basically instruct the GIS that they need to remove these objects here. So it, we use the status of the features in AUD to dictate whether or not they get exported. So existing unchanged is the GIS status that basically says this is an object that was pulled from GIS. So it will not look at these and say, hey, this object needs to be sent back. However, if I specify the status to be demolish, remove, and then I do the same for this object over here. it will mark those two as objects that should be sent back for removal in the GIS. Now, we don't know whether or not this is actually going to be removed directly or whether it will be part of the state management of the objects later on as the design goes through various design states within Small World, but it will be sent back and flagged as being something that needs to be removed as if the work was being done directly in the GIS. And then finally, I'm just going to select this transformer over here and I'm going to change the model on it or actually assign a model to it. I'm going to say it's 37 kVA transformer and then finally I'll just make it existing um, modified. And this is now an update basically saying here we want to change this object in the target system. Okay, so there's a very, very simple little layout of features. Um, I could you know, do more analysis, do more work on it, but for the purposes of the demo here, all I need to do now is um, is basically just start to send this stuff back. But before I do that, I, what I want to do is just verify what I have actually changed in this design. And just to make it a bit easier for myself, I'm going to remove uh, my background map. And I will also clear the navigation mark. It's just got rid of that little pole marker there. Um, but if I use a tool called the Design Feature Lister, what this does is it shows me in the whole in the overall AUD world what objects have been flagged for export to Small World or to the GI, the target GIS, whatever it is. And it shows me information about them. So I can see I've got some segments and some service points. One is marked for update to an AUD status of demolish remove. One is marked for insert, and it has these models, etc. Um, and I can basically go through and say, well, this is, you know, I can check what's in the in the design so I can see all the changes that have been made. If I wanted to, I can go and say, oh, where am I there? Sorry about that. If I wanted to, instead of just seeing the changes, I can say, show me everything that was imported. So now it will go and find me all of the objects in the entire model. But normally you just want to say, well, just verify the changes that you've made. Are they, do they look good? Have you set the right model names, et cetera, and going from there. So now finally, I can go back and I can actually send this uh, set of design changes back to small. So if I do small world GIS export, what it does is it pops up a dialogue. Now in this design or drawing rather, I could have potentially done land changes. I could have created some new land base to support the design and electric, and I could have done some gas work as well. So I have to tell the output process this is how I want you to send, or this is what I want you to send. So I have to select that I want to send the electric data over. And what I'm doing now is, is doing another model map exercise in um, uh, the extract transform transformation and loading, but this time it's reading from AUD, transforming back into the schema appropriate for small world, and then loading into the small world database. And 
when we send stuff back to small world, we're actually using this playback mechanism. We're not actually writing directly to small world features. What we actually do is we write those objects, those transactions into a, a storage, a, a, a kind of a, a holding pen called the playback database, which contains the, the changes and understands the changes, doesn't make them in the GIS directly, but provides an air gap between the designer's activities and the GIS user's um, activities as well. So now, as a designer, my, my, my job's kind of done here at this level. It's sent the changes, and I don't really have any other further interest in what's going to happen with the features in terms of what the GIS folks do, but I just know that I've sent the design, it got over there, and it's up to them to do what they want to do. So now I'm just going to jump into small world, and this is the, the general small world uh, kind of user interface. Um, basically, we have sets of databases with features that are visible, a map viewer, and then an editor with some other asset information, related information. And what's happened is the changes that I sent over got saved into a playback database. And my job now is to, is to basically take and look for that playback job, assign it to somebody who will then be tasked with the, the responsibility of playing back and making sure those changes go into the database correctly. And we have two dialogues that we'd normally work with. The first is the playback administrator, which shows me all of the jobs available. Um, and in this case, this is the job that I just got sent back. Uh, it was created uh, 10.01 today. Um, it's not assigned at the moment. Uh, but it has a, a work order number, a notification number. It's an electric job. Um, and what, the, what I need to do now is basically I'm going to assign it to myself. And having assigned the job to myself, it will then be available for me to do work against it with the second of the dialogues, which is the playback manager. Now, this administrator process, we, you know, this is the simplest form of the administration in terms of divvying up jobs between uh, GIS technicians. We, we could automatically assign it to people based on their operating company or their availability or their specific uh, skill sets or GIS users, technicians could could uh, go say give, give me the next job, give me the next job or we could catalog it in any other way we, 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 that the, uh, a, a customer would want to have it implemented. So basically there's lots of variations here that we can go through to, um, to, to, to uh, go through the process of, of identifying who should be tasked with, with doing the playback. Having done that assignment, as a GIS user, I can now go to the playback administrator, the playback manager tab, and this will show me jobs that are assigned to me. And I've just assigned this one to myself. Um, if I click on the job here, I can see that there's a series of, of uh, element groups or classes of things that need to be done. I've got updates to wire segments, I've got inserts to wire segments, and these are these are the small world GIS objects, power transformer updates, uh, energy consumer updates and inserts. So if I, click, if I click on a power transformer update and I click on that, what it will do is it will go in now and look at the existing object in the small world database and it will look at the proposed values and put them side by side. So I can say, well, what is going to be the net effect of the update if I allow this to run? It will go from here to here. And perhaps what I should do is actually jump to the location of this job as well. So if I select right at the top level and I say go to, if I now put on highlighting, it will draw a straw man of the uh, of the features that it sees in the in the playback process. And it will do it basically at the hierarchy level that I select and below. So if I select power transformers, there's the power transformer over here. Um, if I you know, selected individual ones, it would select at that individual level. There's the, the thing that's going to be updated down here. It will show me in this instance for an update to an existing object. It will say I'm going to change the status from existing to proposed remove. For an insert, it will only show me the proposed values, i.e. there is no existing object. So I have to go ahead and, and basically do the changes as is. Now, when it comes to playing back, uh, Small World is a, is a version managed long transactional database where it sits on top of the series databases. So I'm not read access, read, read only, I'm not read, uh, writable, sorry, against the database at the moment, I'm read only, but there are multiple databases. When I open a design in Small World on the electric database, it may open the electric database writable, 
in an alternative, it may open the land-based database in a writable alternative as well. And there's a number of steps associated with that. But in order to make it easy for myself, if I just swipe up here and just click this select activity button, what it will do is it will go and actually go through the design manager process of creating alternatives, navigating to those alternatives, updating all of the design manager tables to make sure that um, uh, you know, I'm correctly working within the design manager environment because there's a series of state input tables and processes that need to be updated as well. So it's not just going to and making the database writable. This is going through a whole API set of checks to, to open up the design as if I was designing it and digitizing it directly in small. And then finally, when it comes back, having opened the design, taken me to that design alternative, um, it will now say, yes, you are writable at that level. So if I want to go ahead and do some work now, I can select an individual thing and I can say, oh, well, here's one. It's that there. I can say, run that action. And what it will do is it will go ahead and it will do the update on that wire segment. So if I now select it, it'll show me that the lifecycle status is now proposed remove on that object, but it hasn't done anything else. So what we can do with this is we can basically either click at the top level if you feel that way inclined and just go ahead and run everything, or as I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go and actually do each individual insert uh, manually. So here's a, here's a new object, here's an um, insert of a wire segment. And what I can do is I can open it up in an editor. So over here, it will open up the editor and load all of the attributes that it knows about for that object, which it didn't do. Hmm. Don't know why it didn't do that. Um, but basically, you know, I can use this to, to, to affect things. So if I'll do it with the transformer, if I load it up and put it into an object editor for the existing object. So now, what the effect of the playback operation is, is just that I, I would, it, basically I can just press the update button and it will go ahead and make the change directly um, within here. So if I needed to add more information, you know, if the designer didn't know some aspects of this that were mandatory attributes required for the ability to place a power or update or a, a transformer, the designer or the, the GIS technician could take that, augment the attributes required, and then effectively do the insert update or delete operation directly and then having done that i can now select up here and say yes that one's done so i can go through and step through all of these changes that i want or i can just go back up here and say okay that's enough i've shown enough now i'm just going to go ahead and run the rest and it will just go and find everything else that's missing and it will go ahead now and, and complete those set of changes so now when i go and look in here i select the transformer I can see it's it's lifecycle status is proposed replace. Um, so it's going to be removing uh, the assets up here um, and it will then be replacing it with the new um, model of transformer that is the the one that came back from the from the uh, AUD design. So basically by going through these steps, it has allowed me to um, affect the changes as part of the design and this design this playback job is now finished such that if I go back into my playback administrator and I now look at this job here it shows me that it is now completed um, and I'll look at some of the other attributes here I, I, obviously I, I showed you the previous it was an electric job type but now it's recorded information about when it was completed um, when it was assigned who it was assigned by who it was assigned to date completed and I believe there's internally a who completed the work step as well um, that basically allows PSE to monitor um, the time it takes from designs being exported to being assigned to then being completed so they have a, a feeling for, for metrics of the performance of the playback process so they understand what's happening okay so um, before I go on, the, 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 I want to also kind of kind of go back and circle back on the playback operation itself. So uh, there's there's three main reasons why we have playback as a as a mechanism for writing data into GIS systems. Um, you know, we could potentially just take the AUD design and write back to feature classes in 
uh, in the in the target GIS directly, and that will be perfectly feasible. But there's, there's for a number of reasons we, we've found that's just not the way that, that that most implementations or integrations between AUD and GIS really want to go. And the first reason for that is uh, the GIS managers typically want to have some kind of air gap um, between what designers are doing and how it's affecting their representation of the real world in the in the GIS itself. There may be designers may use different mapping standards, different geometries, different attributes that are not uh, directly applicable or valid or, or, or good for the GIS. Yeah, you know, we have one customer, I believe, where they do the designs in AUD, they send the changes back and the GIS technicians take all the physical attributes of the changes, but they ignore completely the geometries. They redigitize the geometries because the mapping standards between the GIS and the um, the AUD design page construction standards are so different that automatically we can't mutate the two to work together. So GIS technicians will, will use that air gap and use the tools in Playback Manager to redigitize the geometries, but they'll keep all the physical attributes and the relationships and everything else that comes across. So it really will help them to ensure the best quality data. The second is a bit of a selfish reason, quite frankly, um, for, for using playback is it makes it a lot easier for us to uh, implement uh, integration between uh, AUD and the GIS. Typically, GISs have a lot of validation, a lot of trigger behavior, uh, a lot of uh, protection of the data that's within there. And in many cases, it may be that AUD and the model in AUD just doesn't have the same level of information that might be required, such that if we attempted to, to do direct write backs, um, we may in some cases not be able to allow that feature to be written because it fails validation rules within the GIS. The playback tables that we did write back to, which are represented by this job object, um, and then by the, the hierarchy that you see below here, these tables have little or no validation on them. Basically, they just store the information. And it's the playback manager which then looks at that information and says, is it good to go? And if it's not, I'll allow the user to change it or I'll attempt to change it on the fly, but the user tells me if it's right. So it's a, there's a, a somewhat selfish and um, self-serving reason for having playback in that it makes it easier and faster for us to implement those changes. And then the third uh, playback kind of strength, if you will, is is a little, hard, a little more harder to uh, conceptualize if you, unless you're familiar with long transaction databases, and that's conflict resolution. So in my little design I've done just here, if you imagine that I was working on this design for months, if not years, before I was ready to send it back, it was held up for construction or whatever, and various for various reasons, it took a long time before I sent it back. If in, the, in that intermediate time, another design had come through and had made some changes to the transformer or removed the transformer and put it somewhere else or removed the poles or something else had happened. Um, if I then attempted to make those changes from AUD, it would cause conflicts in, in the database terminology, basically saying you're trying to update or change something that someone else has already changed since you started making your changes. And that causes a whole mess of problems with long transactional databases and as such is very, very complex to, to solve. With our AUD GIS integration, we don't offer conflict resolution. We can highlight conflicts. You know, we have functionality we've written the past where you can basically say in an AUD design, go and show me objects that I've imported that potentially have changed since I, I first imported them. We can go back and look in the GIS and say, this could be a conflict at this point. We don't necessarily know how to explain it and we don't know how to solve the problem for the user. We don't suggest that we would be able to automatically anyway. Um, but what we're saying is by doing the playback operation, no, there are guaranteed no conflicts because if I come to playback this uh, power transformer here and it says update it and it says, well, there's no object to update. It's not there anymore. It's up to me as the GIS technician to decide how do I resolve this design in the real world now? What has changed? Has this transformer been moved onto another pole that, because this one got knocked down? In which case I can select the other pole and select the other transformer and say update from this object here or I could manually make the change and then just mark it that I've completed the piece of work at that point and that would be a, a way of semi-automatically performing the playback steps that would get past those conflicts and make it that we keep the GIS as higher quality as possible 
while not preventing the designers from doing the best quality job they want to do. And um, now I was going to do like a really quick overview of model mapper, but I think Paul's going to do something on that. And I'm right up against the wire on my time now. And if there are any questions, um, it may be beneficial just to stop. I've got four minutes left. So um, I'm going to hand over at this point and say, well, this is pretty much the end of the demo. Are there any questions? Yes, so you've got a question coming from Tim at Central Hudson. It says, is the GIS small world mapping what's used for the field crews? Is PSCE using digital or paperwork orders? How are the as built handled? Uh, that's, a Josh, that's a Josh question, I think. Uh, the... Yeah, I can. <clears throat> Brandon, do you want to answer that or would you like me to? Uh, go for it. Okay. Um, first of all, hi, everybody. My name is Josh Douglas. I'm under Brandon Razzo here at PSC. I'm one of three of the CAD AUD admins here. Um, my main job is actually handling the AUD configuration. Um, but so th was that, that question was about how our as built handled in terms and are they digitized and whatnot? Yes. Um, so right now, it's still, there's, that's, that's a big kink kind of still in the process because as of right now, um, the as-builts are still done um, by paper. So the crew goes out in the field, they do their red lines, they do their stuff, and then they um, get either a digital copy of that PDF um, back to us, the mapping group, or they sometimes, um, you know, mail that down to the mapping groups. Um, so it's, it's, and then the mapper will then take that and make those red lines, make those as-built corrections um, by hand. So that part's not digitized. In a perfect world, it would be nice to keep it all digital because that's that really is one of the um, big key kinks in the system is when you go digital and digitized and have all these interfaces when you, I guess, reverse engineer and go backwards at the end of the steps here, it does throw um, some curveballs into the system. But yeah, right, right now we're just doing paper updates uh, manually um, by the mappers. The second part of that question was, is the GIS small world mapping uh, what's used for the field crew? Uh, no. No, we actually um, have cascading uh, GIS and tensing is used in the field. So it's basically an extract of our GIS data. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't understand the question fully. I didn't know if you meant what design are they using to reference when they're in the field or what, I mean, but yeah, what Brandon said is true. We have the external mapping systems that they can use to look at our overall map. And then they also have the, obviously the AUD design on 22 by 34 or whatever layout to reference as well that the designer made. Yeah, I'll just comment too. This is Dennis Beck. We found the as-built problem to be a really interesting one. Uh, we find so many organizations are doing very different things. You know, they could have PDFs, they could have kind of red line type of markups. Some are doing vector markups. So we would really always welcome your feedback on your, how you're doing it and ways we can help to solve these problems. We've started to do some proof of concept work with different mobile vendors on this. And so, you know, we will continue to, to work on solving this problem because it is really one of the more interesting integrations to get done. So we'll always look for your feedback on, on your ASBIT problems. Yeah, and to that note, I think it was at Sergey that was given that mobile demo. Yeah. Um, there's some, I really do see some huge opportunities in the future um, for having, because, you know, our, our contractors, for example, uh, recently got updated to tablets, most of them, the field crews, and it's, it's a big cultural shift. Uh, people get nervous and scared of these types of things, so it's not something that can happen tomorrow. But I really do see us trending towards a really, um, you know, uh, up, it's 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 going to be fortuitous in the future because I really think it's going to be able to stay digital and crews out there in the field actually on their tablet or whatever and be able to make these as-built changes on their tablet, giving that digital information back to us. Um, I do see that coming around the corner, hopefully. Um, it's just like the cultural communication and, and change that's the hardest right hey, josh, josh so the, the, in, your, in your environment as well you have the construction view as well so when changes are posted from the design they get scooped up and put into the construction view for all Correct. the users. 
Correct. Yeah. So that's the full circle of things. That's that's the, another cool benefit about what Andy's uh, showing is once this process is completed as far I, I'm not super familiar to know in small world enough, but I know you have to somehow complete this transaction that Andy's showing you and then it'll um, post that and then you can see that in our um, company wide what Brandon was talking about. We use Esri Map Viewer. And that's what over 1,800 of uh, people have access to in PSC. So they can go see, oh, okay, Andy did a really horrible design and I can go see it um, and I can go look it up um, and I can see what assets are there and it's in a pre-construction status. So it's not actually constructed yet, but hey, that means Andy had to get a permit. So maybe I'll piggyback, I'll give Andy a call. I'll say, hey, can I, can I include some stuff in your permit so I don't have to apply? Or if you're double booking and like a, control zone or something in a state highway or a clear zone or anything like that, um, gas and electric, uh, maybe you, you know, you're you doing two different jobs in the same area. It's very useful. And then from there, you can actually play back in that same area into AUD and see those same assets, And but they won't be existing unchanged status anymore. They'll be existing proposed, which I know is a little bit confusing at first, not going to be existing and proposed. But what that's saying is, it's existing, but it's in proposed status. So that way designers can now utilize those assets that were initially pushed from AUD and they can reuse it coming back into AUD, um, just understanding that it's a pre-construction status. Yeah, very good. All right, we have other questions too. Uh, Brian, do you wanna read up on this one or do you want me to go ahead? Um, so I'm gonna, um, Jump David's comment real quick, just to continue on with Tim's question. It says, are digital work orders something that anyone in the pug is successfully doing? As far as as built is what he's probably mentioning? I, I believe so. Are you sure, or does that mean like digitizing work orders from within AUV? I think that's, I think Andy, you're right. I think that's what, because obviously we are, PSC is, but um, and he, I think he means as anyone else. I know, I know PowerPoint do that as well. They, 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 we have a big process down there for those guys. They're a small world site as well. And, we, and they have their own design manager type uh, work management system built into small world. And we, they basically digitize polygons, create the features in AUD, and we export them with model map directly writing them into a short transaction database in small world that stores their projects and then that project becomes the boundary for any import so when you come to download features to support a design in AUD at PowerCore you don't even digitize a polygon because you use the work order boundary that you've already digitized that's true Oh, and also just a word of caution to anyone looking at the small world environment and integrating with AUD one of the learning curves we are now encountering and working through is something Andy spoke to. I think Andy mentioned how different companies can utilize the configuration, different aspects, but there is there is a big thing going from AUD to, to Small World and, and Small World's requirements are sometimes much different than what AUD uh, delivers. So um, just have that conversation and that communication and testing um, and do, do it thoroughly um, prior to, so you can really figure out, all right, how can we best leverage this interface and not force it to where we think it's gonna do everything, but we get it to use it at, at its highest capacity for what it best can do best. And then maybe we just still do some manual things because um, you know, in, in, our, in our experience right now, it's not doing, uh, we're not using it 100%, but I don't think we're going to be able to, but we're going to get be able to get close. We just need to work on those processes and have a clear understanding of where the line is to stop. Okay, thanks, Josh. Um, we're going to go back to, to David's question here now. Um, it says, I've been thinking about how we could use the AUD workflow function that Dave Wilbur mentioned last week. It occurred to me that using it in, to download features from GIS and perform simple design activities may be a benefit that we can leverage easily. Is there any plan to develop UDH to integrate with AUD workflow to allow functions such as GIS Navigator and Import Workspace to be run via the ACAD command line? with no pop-up dialogue input required or from within the AUD rules. Yeah, 
Yeah, Andy. Let's oh, hear yeah. it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I mean, is Paul Gravel on or Steve Milligan or one of those guys? Because they, they may have come across that. I, I'm not familiar with, with what you're talking about on the AUD side. So, Yeah, I, I can maybe speak to that or, or Paul. No, uh, I'll let you speak to it, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, everything you described, I, I think, is, uh, you know, the future direction of this. Uh, we're just getting that uh, new workflow capability, you know, put together and uh, and fleshed out. But yeah, I, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities, just like you describe, um, you know, possibly hooking it in as a post-processing step uh, on import uh, or integrating into UDH's various, you know, kind of workflow design steps. So um, that that was really some of the original intent on, on using that capability. Uh, we just haven't had a chance to integrate it into those areas yet. Cool. And last question that we have is from Scott. Is there a white paper or other documentation that illustrates the best approach to start an integration like this? Well, we have, a. I mean, basically when we do a model map implementation, we have a, a typically a, some kind of workshop a day, two days, maybe longer, if there's a lot more features. And we have a series of uh, PowerPoints that are really effectively uh, a tool for guiding the workshop, which compose uh, discussions of things that may be of value or are, are required as part of the integration in the form of questions or of um, or kind of like guidance. You know, we've seen people do this. Do you want to do that? Would you like to do this? Is this something that you've seen? You know, what coordinate systems do you want to use in the drawings? Do you use multiple coordinate systems in your AUD designs? But, I mean, just it, I think it's like about 60 or 70 slide deck at one point it was anyway. It may be even more now of, of, of just basically questions and tutorials, case studies and examples that help guide a workshop. Um, in terms of a white paper, I don't think we've ever distilled it down to that level. I, I might be wrong, but but I know that the workshops I've been involved in have involved capturing the information and then writing that up as a design uh, based on following the, the steps within those workshops.